Hello! Today we're going to talk about radioactive decay. This is in fact our final movie of the year. So we have two goals today. We're going to look at trends in what we call the chart of the nucleides. And then we'll look at how a sample of radioactive material decays as time goes by. Okay, so this uh, sort of amoeba-like chart here is known as the chart of the nucleides. At the bottom left is where you find hydrogen. And then as you move to the right, the number of neutrons increases. As you move up, the number of protons, the Z number, increases. We see this kind of uh, black kind of staircase running along the spine of our amoeba here. And the black ones represent this, the stable nuclei. So I'm going to call that the kind of zone of stability right through the middle. You note that if you go too far up to the upper right where your nuclei are so large, uh, you don't find any that are stable. Okay, so there are various colors on this chart. There's kind of this uh, nice light blue color. There's a yellow and some green toward the top. And there's kind of a pink or purplish that's kind of below the, uh, the line of stability. Okay, so those colors represent different decay types. So what do you think blue, the light blue, represents in the chart of the nucleides? Alpha decay, beta plus decay, beta minus decay, gamma decay. Okay, so puzzle over that for a second, and then we'll reveal the answer. And this chart, by the way, comes from Brookhaven National Lab, and you can see the, the Z equals N line here, and the fact that N number of neutrons increases as you go to the right, and Z number of protons increases as you go up. Okay, but the basic idea here is that the if a nuclei decays, it generally decays into something that's more stable, or at the very least, when it decays, it decays into something that is closer to this black zone of stability along the spine of our amoeba, our chart of the nucleides. Okay, so by the way, uh, all horizontal lines on this chart uh, are all different isotopes or nucleides of the same element, and all vertical lines are in fact a set of all different elements, but they all happen to have the same number of, uh, of neutrons. Okay, so in this case, back to the blue. If you decay by a blue process, what you really want to be doing is moving down and to the right. And if you're in the blue zone, down and to the right takes you toward, or maybe even into, this zone of stability, this black region. And so, in fact, that's what all these blue uh, blue nucleides um, denote that there's a beta plus decay that goes on for them. And a beta plus means you get another neutron, but you decrease the number of protons. So basically a proton turns into a, uh, a neutron and a positron. Okay, so that's beta plus. And we'll go over some of the other ones. So if you're in this pink purpley zone, then what you want to do is have a decay process that takes you up and to the left, and a beta minus process will do that. In a beta minus process, a um, neutron decays, so you lose a neutron, n goes down by one, and that neutron turns into a proton, so you get an extra proton, z goes up by one, uh, plus you get a um, you get a what? Let's see, we need something with a uh, negative sign, right? We need an electron. And we need a, um, we in both the beta plus and the beta minus, you get some kind of neutrino. Okay, so beta plus produces a positron, beta minus produces an electron, and a positron is actually the antimatter equivalent of, of an electron. It's got the, all the same characteristics except for it's uh, got the opposite sign. 
Okay, and then if you're in the yellow zone, you actually want to kind of go down and to the left, and that is exactly what an alpha decay does. So in alpha decay, you spit out a helium nucleus, and a helium has nucleus has two neutrons and two um, protons. So whatever is left over, the big thing left over, has two fewer neutrons and two fewer protons. Okay, so those are the basic trends in the chart of the nuclei, but the basic idea is that all the decays take you closer to the, uh, the zone of stability, the black line in the chart. Okay, so let's get into radioactivity. So if you're looking at an individual nucleus, there's just no way to say when that nucleus is going to decay. However, if you have a whole bunch, 10 to the 20 nuclei, you know, it's a massive number of nuclei, then you can apply statistical rules to predict the general decay pattern for a large number of radioactive nuclei. And it turns out that the rate at which nuclei decay is proportional to the number of nuclei there are, and this is a number n. And we've already used n for the number of neutrons. This is the whole different n. This is just a number of radioactive nuclei. <clears throat> okay, so whenever you find that the rate is proportional to the number you have, uh, you're going to get an exponential function. So here's this equation. It says rate is minus delta n over delta t. Hmm, that's an interesting. Why is there a minus sign? Well, you're losing uh, radioactive nuclei. So delta n itself is negative. So rate is a positive quantity. Delta n is negative, so putting the minus in front of the delta n over delta t produces a positive quantity. And then we can also say that's equal to lambda n. It's proportional to n, and our proportionality constant is lambda, what we call the decay constant. And then there's a nice relationship between the decay constant and the half-life. Okay, so we're re reusing lots of symbols here. n is the number of nuclei, radioactive nu nuclei. Uh, lambda is not a wavelength, it's a decay constant. And this thing, delta n over delta t, we call the activity. So it's basically number of um, decays that happen per unit time, per second, per minute, per hour, per whatever. Okay, lambda again is the decay constant. Okay, so some more. And so as, you, as I mentioned before, whenever the rate at which something occurs is proportional to the number of objects you have, then you've got an exponential. And in this case, it's a negative exponential because we're losing things. So we've got an equation that says n, the number of radioactive nuclei you have right now, at some t after, sometime t after we started uh, following these things, is n naught, the number you had at t equals 0, times e to the minus lambda t. And if you draw a graph of this, you get this nice exponential decay kind of curve. Okay, so n naught again is the initial number, t equals 0. n is the number that remain after some time t. And let's see how the decay constant relates to the half-life. The half-life is going to be when n equals 1 half of n naught, so half of uh, the particles have decayed. That takes a time equal to a half-life. The half-life turns out to be natural log of 2 over lambda, or in other words, lambda is natural log of 2 over the half-life. You can write it either one of those ways. Natural log of 2 happens to be very close to 0 0.693. Okay, another way to write this equation, instead of n is n naught e to the minus lambda t, you can write it kind of in terms of the number of half-lives that have gone by. So you can say n, number of radioactive nuclei remaining after a time t, is n naught, the number you start with, divided by 2 to the power of t the time divided by t to the one-half. t to the one-half is the half-life. Okay, so if your half-life is 10 minutes and 40 minutes have gone by, then you get t over t to the one-half is 4. You get n equals n naught over 2 to the fourth. Okay, so you've gone down by a factor of 2 to the fourth, which is 16 after four half-lives. One half-life gets you half left, another half life, a quarter is left, another half life, an eighth is left, another half life, a sixteenth is left, etc. Okay, there's our graph again, in case you've forgotten what it looked like.
let's talk about units. So we can measure the activity, that's delta n over delta t, that can be measured in disintegrations per second, okay? And the SI unit for this is called the Becquerel, symbolized with BQ. This is capital B because it's named after, I believe his name was Henri Becquerel, a French scientist. Okay, so number of radioactive decays per second. That's the Becquerel. So seven Becquerels, seven decays per second. Seven, seven million Becquerels, seven million decays per second. Uh, another, another common unit is actually the Curie, and there's a conversion factor here. So one Curie is 3.7 times 10 to the 10 decays per second, or 3.7 times 10 to the 10 Becquerels. And that, of course, is named after Marie Curie. Okay, so that's actually a pretty large number of decays per second. If you're hanging around a one Curie source, you actually don't really want to be around a one Curie source. So a lot of sources you might find in a lab are measured in millicuries or microcuries. So Curie is a pretty hot source. Okay, we can also use uh, radioactive decays to do some dating. We can date objects, in other words, tell how old they are, that kind of dating, uh, using various radioactive uh, nucleides. And carbon-14 is, uh, is an example of this. And what you want to do really is match the half-life to kind of the order of magnitude of the age of the object. Okay, So carbon-14 is great if you want to measure things that are several hundred to several um, tens of thousands years, year, uh, years old. But if you're much less old than that, or way, way older than that, you want to use something else with a more appropriate half-life. Okay, so why do we use carbon-14? Well, carbon is taken up by all living things from the atmosphere. And it turns out that the ratio of carbon in the atmosphere is fairly constant at about one atom of carbon-14 for every 8.3 atoms, 10 to the 11 atoms of carbon. Okay, so there's almost no carbon-14, of course, but we can still pick up this tiny, tiny amount from the decays that it produces. Now, you might say, well, why hasn't all the carbon-14 just gone away completely from radioactive decay? Because the Earth has been around for billions of years, and carbon-14 has a half-life of less than 6,000 years, 5,730 years. So I'll put, give you that number in a minute. Again, well, it turns out that uh, carbon-14 is produced in the atmosphere at a particular rate, and there's an equilibrium between the rate at which carbon-14 is produced in the atmosphere by, uh, by protons coming in and interacting with uh, nitrogen. There's an equilibrium between that rate and the rate at which carbon-14 atoms in the atmosphere are decaying away. So it's a pretty steady rate. Now, we've actually modified this rate uh, by exploding nuclear bombs and things like that. Okay, so the rate actually, uh, the kind of the fraction of carbon-14 actually went up for a while when we were doing nuclear testing, things like that. Okay, so if an organism which has been steadily taking up carbon throughout its lifetime, if it dies, then it no longer takes in carbon from the atmosphere and the carbon-14 gradually decays away inside that thing. So carbon-14, again, has a half-life of 5730 years, 5730 years. And again, it's useful for measuring uh, ages that are of that order of magnitude. And very famous applications of what we call radiocarbon dating, dating using carbon-14, includes dating of the Shroud of Turin. That was dated to the 13th or 14th centuries. And there was also a famous find in the Alps. I think this was very close to the Austrian-Italian border. In fact, it was so close to the border that it was, that it was a kind of a dispute as to which side of the border he was on. Uh, anyway, this guy was called Utzi, the Iceman. He was found in the Alps because of, uh, you know, melting glaciers um, in 1991. And they dated Utzi to 3300 BC with radiocarbon dating. So he's about a uh, little more than 5,000 years old.
Okay, so let's use this equation, see how we use this, this equation here. So here's an example. So you're on an archaeological dig, and you dig up a wooden spear handle. You find the activity level of carbon-14 in the handle is 35% of that in an equivalent piece of wood that comes from a tree that was chopped down just last week. How old is your spear handle? Okay, so we're going to make one major assumption. Turns out not to be that bad, but our assumption is that the, um, the ratio of carbon-14 to regular carbon in the atmosphere has stayed fixed over time. Now, if you were really doing an accurate measurement, you would correct for everything we know about carbon-14, about its historical uh, ratio. But for now, we'll just pretend that uh, it was steady over time. Okay, so the activity here, of course, is proportional to the number of carbon-14 uh, atoms that remain in the spear handle. And so we can, therefore, use our equation, n is n naught e to the minus lambda t. And what are we going to do with this 35% number? Well, we can say that n, the number remaining now, is just 0.35, 35% of the number of carbon 14s we must have had initially. Because initially, when the wood was fresh, it should be uh, a match to fresh wood we can find today. Okay, so we're going to say, and that again is under the assumption that. The ratio of carbon-14 to regular carbon in the atmosphere is fixed over time. Okay, so we plug n is 0.35 n naught in on the left-hand side. The n naughts cancel out, and we get 0.35 is e to the minus lambda t. And we're going to try and solve this equation for time, t. Okay, so what do we do? We want to rescue t on the right-hand side, which is now currently in the exponential. So we're, what we're going to do is take the natural log of both sides. And the natural log is the inverse function of the exponential function. So when we take the natural log of the right-hand side, we just bring down the exponent, minus lambda t. On the left-hand side, we get natural log 0.35. Now, initially, this might uh, worry you because you have a negative number on the right. Well, well, we actually have a negative number on the left as well. The natural log of any number less than 1 is negative. So that's going to cancel out the negative we have on the right-hand side. Okay, so we're going to solve for time. Just rearrange the equation. t is negative ln 0.35 over lambda, the, the decay constant. Now we'll bring in our half-life, our well-known half-life for carbon-14. And our lambda is uh, natural log of 2 divided by the half-life. So we replaced lambda in our equation by natural log of 2 divided by the half-life, which is 5,730 years. Okay, so we can rearrange that and bring the 5,730 years up on top, and we get minus ln 0.35 over ln 2 times 5,730 years. Now, one thing I forgot to mention is you probably want to think about, you know, roughly how many half-lives have gone by here right at the beginning. So if you've got 35% of your radioactive material left, well, let's see. If we go through one half-life, we're down to 50%. Two half-lives brings us down to 25%. So 35% is somewhere between one and two half-lives. Okay. So when you do negative ln 0.35 over ln 2, first of all, you'll end up with a positive number. And that gets you very close to 1.5, Okay, which is in the range we expect, somewhere between one and two half-lives. So we get about 1.5, one half-lives, I think, in this case. And so we get 8,680 years old would be our the age of our spear handle here. Okay, so that's uh, a good way to use that equation. And um, just a re little refresher on how to use natural logs and, and things like that. Okay, so... Uh, Thanks for listening to a whole year, maybe, of uh, these movies. And this is the last one. Okay. See you in class.